and share screen. Good morning and welcome everyone. Today's session is designed to provide you with information regarding the general supervision and monitoring system of, uh, uh, system of supervision and monitoring activities and timelines for special purpose private schools that are in the 2023 and 24 cohort, as well as an opportunity to ask questions. And we'll start with introductions. I'm Mary Adley. I'm the coordinator for state agency programs at the Department of Education. And my I wouldn't be able to do what I do without my amazing team. So I'm gonna pass it off to Sarah to introduce herself. Good morning, Sarah Ferguson, uh, education specialist on Mary's team. And the next person, because we've joined uh, some capacity recently, is Gay that came to our team. So I'd love to have you introduce yourself, Gay. Hello, good morning. Nice to meet everybody and put a, a face with a name. And I am working with a team as an office specialist. And last but certainly not least, we're so excited to have Leora join us for the um, for uh, for lots of her uh, expertise in both programming and her work previously on the federal monitoring team. So, Leora, would you introduce yourself to folks or reintroduce yourself to those that already know you? <laughs> okay. Hi, everybody. I'm Leora. Um, I'm also an education specialist, and I am very happy to be partnering with the um, SPPS team. And Barbara McGowan is unable to join us today. She's the fiscal director. Um, so I'm going to provide an overview of the fiscal information um, today later in the presentation. Next slide. Let's begin with a general supervision flowchart to provide a visual depiction of the monitoring process for special purpose private schools. And that's really tiny writing. I know you guys got a copy of it. So Sarah's gonna zoom in a little bit. Um, uh, an overview of the specific elements of both the desk audit component and the site visit components will be provided during our webinar today. They both follow the same process. Currently, all site visits occur prior to the desk audit being due, but if any of our site visits require rescheduling, they will occur after the desk audit is due just because of the timing in our schedules. So, <clears throat> excuse me, so I'm gonna review the flow chart. After evidence is submitted for either the desk audit or the site visit, a letter of finding is sent to both the SPPS and the referring SAUs. And when all elements of either the desk audit or the site visit are fulfilled, a letter of continued approval for each, the desk audit and the site visit is also sent, or a letter of completion, not approval, a letter of completion of those monitoring activities um, is sent to both the SPPS and their referring SAUs. Corrective evidence submitted for both the desk audit and the site visit will be reviewed upon submission until the due date. Any unmet elements will result in a combined desk audit and site visit corrective action plan with an established timeline for the cap to be closed. The corrective activity, uh, the corrective action plan evidence is submitted and reviewed upon submission. Again, this is an interactive process. Um, so it, you don't have to wait till the due date. You can send in information, it'll get reviewed and you can get feedback, you can get training and support along the way. And when all CAP elements are satisfied, a letter of acknowledge, uh, acknowledging the successful completion of the SPPS General System of Supervision and Monitoring and consequently continued school approval will be um, sent to you by our Director um, of Special Services, Aaron Frazier. And next slide. Once every three years, each SPPS will be monitored to evaluate SAU out of unit placements in special purpose private schools, as outlined in MUSER, and to ensure continued approval steps. Each SPPS has been placed into a monitoring cohort for the purposes of monitoring special education activities in these schools. We have a table that captures our um, cohort 
uh, schools, SDPSs, from 2022 through 2028, outlined on the DOE website. The forms that the, our monitoring team uses were emailed to, your, uh, to you, the cohort, last week. Thanks, Gay. Um, and you can feel free to call or email any members of this SPPS monitoring team if you have any questions. Our contact information um, will be reviewed and is provided on the last slide of the presentation for you. And this webinar is being recorded and a link will be put on the DOE Special Services website so you um, and your staff can access it and reference it as needed. Um, we're going to be presenting a lot of information today with some demonstrations and modeling and an opportunity to an opportunity to explore specifically the EMT or, or, or actually the OSR tool that your SPPS will use to self audit your files. In addition, um, we've built in time between sections of the webinar for questions and answers rather than waiting until the end for all of the questions over, the, over all the materials. Um, so next, we're gonna briefly review the events in the SPPS general supervision monitoring process before talking about each component in more depth. We will conduct site visits in the fall this year. They're all scheduled. Um, we have backup days in the winter um, set aside if rescheduling becomes necessary. Gay has worked already with each agency to identify preferred times for the site visits for each SPPS location in the organization and has scheduled them. At each site visit, the department has historically reviewed student files, interviewed stu staff and students, and toured the facilities. A one hour uh, exit interview to debrief the site visit portion of the review will be scheduled for another day over Zoom. The activities that occur during the site visit, including classroom observations and interviews, may support SPPSs as they refine the desk audit components, such as adequacy of services, continuum of services, education environment, and plan of instruction. Recommendations made during the site visit that are adequately addressed prior to the subsequent desk audit submission will result in no finding for that desk audit component. So if something shows up in your site visit, um, the, um, and you are, are able to knock it off, and it's actually something that's related to the desk audit, it won't show up in the desk audit. It'll sh it, there'll be no finding. The desk audit submissions are due December 29th, 2023. Um, so the list of events that we reviewed today may not necessarily be in the order that they will occur for you, especially if any rescheduling of site visits is necessary. Each special purpose private school will receive two separate letters of finding, one upon completion of site visit activities, approximately four weeks afterward, and the other one by the end of January, 2024 for the desk audit component of your review. The letters will be issued and communicate if there were findings of concern within the program that might affect approval status. The SPPS will have about three months between the desk audit letter of finding and May 10th, 2024 to resolve any identified areas requiring resolution or revision with more time between the site visit letter of finding and May 10th of 2024, which will vary depending on when your site visit occurs. If any of the concerns identified in the letters of findings remain outstanding as of May 10th, 2024, the department will issue a corrective action plan or CAP to address those findings. That's the like formal um, documentation. If all matters are resolved before that due date, the department will issue a letter acknowledging successful completion of monitoring and consequently continued school approval. The special purpose private school will provide evidence to address the elements identified in your CAP, <clears throat> if you have one, by September 15, 2024. Once the evidence for the CAP has been submitted and approved, DOE will issue correspondence as just described, acknowledging successful completion of monitoring and consequently continued school approval. <clears throat> and again, as I mentioned previously, you don't have to wait until your due dates to submit evidence for either letter of finding or the, um, <clears throat> excuse me, aggregated CAP. This is an interactive process and we're here to support you. 
the Department of Education Special Services fiscal team is joining my team in the special purpose private school general supervision review process. Uh, and I will present information uh, pertinent to this portion of the review on Barbara McGowan's behalf later in the presentation. Next slide, please, Sarah. Last week, <clears throat> we sent out a letter of notification and instruction that you or your director have already received. Some of you are, are designees today because your directors weren't available. The purpose of the notification is to inform the Special Purpose Private School of its inclusion in this current cohort of the general supervision monitoring during the 2023-24 school year. We sent notification about this webinar today to all the SEUs that each SPPS has identified as currently having students enrolled or pending enrollments from. And we appreciate those districts that, that have been able to take the time to join us today. We know this is the last remaining remnants of summer and many people are off because they've been working all summer. So thank you for your time and attention to this important um, process. The letter of notification and, uh, and uh, instruction describes the two components of the general supervision process in which documentation is submitted uh, to the SPPS monitoring team and a desk audit. <clears throat> Excuse me. And the first element, the program approval documents, is a table containing all the criteria found in program approval section of MUSER, along with some additional program requirements from general school approval. The documentation to be submitted in support of those criteria is also described in this letter. For the second part, SPPSs will review the student files that they maintain on a certain number of children and complete the on-site review monitoring tool or the what we call the OSR tool to document whether the records um, review that you've reviewed your own records contain all the required materials. This OSR tool has been developed and revised to be consistent with the tool that's used by the federal or also known as public school monitoring team. And we'll be using the same tool for the site visit file review in a different format. Ours will be. Um, next slide. Uh, Gay has, as I indicated, has already scheduled the site visits for each location in your organization. In review at the site visit, the department will review student files, interview staff and students, tour your facilities, and after debriefing internally regarding all site visit activities, will conduct an exit interview on a Zoom call at a later date to debrief the site visit portion of monitoring. The site visits are planned to be conducted in person this year, and our team will pivot if circumstance uh, circumstances warrant. We appreciate everybody's flexibility and emphasize necessity for us to maintain communication regarding circumstances that might warrant alternate plans so that our team, the SPPS monitoring team, can observe each SPPS policies and procedures regarding visitors to make sure that we are um, keeping your vulnerable students and your, your staff, as well as us, all safe. So thank you. And prior to each SPPS, uh, that prior to each site visit, each SPPS will receive a site visit letter from the department confirming your date um, and reviewing the expectations for the site visit. Um, so we ask that, um, that the director of your program be present to assist in the site visit activities. And if your director is unavailable for the full day, we ask that you um, have a designee be available during the times that the director isn't available. And please make sure that there's a confidential workspace for the special services team to review student records. Um, we should have access to a copier. Um, and for agencies with multiple sites, we request that all files be at one site and we'll work with you to determine which site will be the best. And during the site visit, we'd like to offer your school real-time professional development. We encourage you to allow at least one special ed teacher to sit with DOE staff, that would be Leora, and review the elements of the IEP that they wrote, that teacher wrote, um, included in the OSR tool, and teachers will be able to get feedback and ask questions about required forms, IEPs, or anything related to special education. And thank you so much for that valuable service, Leora. <laughs> And um, next slide.
Typically, monitoring activities will begin at 8.30, and within the day, we're going to need time to complete the following activities. An administration interview, ideally at the beginning of the day, uh, um, or a visit to help set the context for the day. We're going to want a tour of the facility. We'd like to, if possible, to do this during a time that we can see students working. We also want to observe a couple of entire classes. Um, from beginning to end. We want to see the process of introducing a lesson, the instruction all the way through to um, the closure piece um, and follow up. There's going to be, uh, Leora will be working on the student file pieces and providing um, PD to special ed teachers. And we're going to need time to conduct interviews. Uh, two teachers, which we do together, the teachers to ed techs, related service providers, we try to do together. They often have ideas that bounce off each other and have found that um, that's, a, that's a great process. We'd also like to um, interview a couple of students that will require prior parental consent, and we'll be interviewing them individually. We don't do the students together as a group like the rest of the, um, the folks that we speak talk with. Um, and uh, we have had students that that um, appreciate and need need um, stu staff support. So that's you know that's up to you guys. You know the students. Um, and um, having a working lunch, we'd love to have people join us to have a general discussion that's not necessarily related to the review. Just have uh, some some time to hang out. <laughs> and um, next slide. Yes, um, and the consent for the student interview was included in the materials that you got from Gay. Yes, absolutely. I am seeing those in my notes now. Um, <laughs> that wasn't it was in the next slide and I moved it up because we're talking about it in that slide. So thank you, Sarah. <laughs> and um, continuing on with the site visit. Um, the review team is flexible and willing to accommodate the school's particular needs around scheduling just, just to communicate with us and we can uh, make, make uh, anything work. And the site visit debriefs by Zoom can be conducted with whomever your school chooses. We have had some debriefs with just the SPPS director who wants to disseminate information. We've also had entire SPPS staff um, applicable staff uh, sit in with the debrief. We've had some with special ed directors from referring SAUs participate and any combination of those scenarios. We're flexible and happy to provide you and your team feedback and observations with the audience that meets your agency needs. And I have just summarized the monitoring process timeline, uh, process and timeline, and we'll provide uh, we will provide more specific site visit information later in the presentation. But we're going to stop and ask if you have any questions about the materials covered thus far. Um, I saw Sarah had to take a call, but yet we're at the questions piece. So anybody have any questions so far? I do, but I feel like I have a lot. <laughs> I'm sorry. So we're just a small school. We only have one special ed teacher. Um, and we only have one service provider for speech. So I'm we we can only provide what we can provide, I'm assuming. Absolutely. Okay. Right. Okay. Yep. Yeah. You're all good. I'm not gonna require two teachers if you only employ one. <laughs> There, and, and that's a very good point, Amanda. There's a variety of sizes of special purpose private schools, and some are very small, and some are um, much larger and have multiple locations around the state. So uh, we'll we'll work with what you have. Okay, great. <laughs> so Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Anything else? No, I. You will. Is is it possible to set up a time to talk um, at another? date just maybe with you yeah absolutely specific to our program okay perfect yeah. thank you of course we are here to support anybody else have any questions about the timeline and the general process and we'll and once we answer those we'll go into the more specific pieces a quick question i think sure star um 
in a hypothetical situation, how do you handle vacancies? Like if there is a, a, a teaching position, but there's a vacancy in that position, um, you know, there would still be potentially two teachers, but if there is a vacancy, how do you handle that? So that is an excellent question. And if you don't mind, I'd like to save it to the end because it's more general. Um, and it is something that applies to most people, but it's not specific to the monitoring process itself or the timeline, um, but to your program. So if you don't mind, I'll save that to the end. But be, why don't you put it in the chat, Star, so that it will be on uh, in front of us and we can come back to that, if you don't mind. Um, okay. Any other questions around the monitoring process, expectations, and timelines? And if not, I'm going to turn it over to Sarah to provide the next pieces. Okay, thank you. Um, so now we're going to review each section of the desk audit in depth. Um, as Mary said, submission of the desk audit materials is due by uh, December 29th, 2023. Um, again, the letter of notification instruction includes a table containing the approved criteria along with description of the materials associated with each of the criteria, which you will submit for your desk audit. Um, for the desk audit, you will submit specific pieces of information, which we'll discuss in detail in a few minutes, and we prefer electronic submissions. Please provide all desk audit materials by scanning evidence for each element into separate, clearly labeled PDF attachments to our SPPS GSS.doe at main.gov email address, which stands for Special Purpose Private School General System of Supervision at Department of Education. Um, so that's what all those letters are for. One email is preferred. However, sometimes email settings prohibit a large file size and more than one email is required. Um, some SPPS have submitted folders through Google Docs or OneNote and we can access both of those. If you send the materials in print form or hard copy, you'll need a three ring binder or an organizer with 12 tabs. Each tab will coincide with a section of the table found on the letter of instruction. When the binder comes to the MDOE, each tab should contain the materials supporting that criterion. The materials may be emailed, mailed, or hand-delivered to our office and are due by 5 p.m. on 12-29-23. And as you all know, you know, at sometime in December is okay. Um, we're going to be asking for things. Sorry admitting somebody. We're going to be asking um, for things from special, from related service providers through November. So uh, we wouldn't expect anything before the beginning of December, but um, we all know that that's holiday time. So of course, if you want to send it in in mid-December, we will accept it. For agencies or organizations with more than one site, please provide a single submission for the agency or organization containing the elements that are common across your SPPS locations, such as the mission of your school or your plan of instruction, elements that relate to specific schools, such as qualification of staff, can be sent in separate emails using the organizational format outlined in the table on the letter of instruction with separate attachments for electronic submissions or tabs for a binder submission for each category. This image depicts the 12 sections of SPPS school approval criteria table included in your letter of instruction that you will be utilizing to construct your desk audit materials. And we can begin reviewing the items on the table. Section one includes admission requirements and the general description of the program. This approval can, element can be found in Title 20A, Section 7204, and in User, Section 12, Paragraph 2, A1A. For this element, please submit the general description of program and admission requirements. Oh, I already read that. Um, please submit your admi administrative policy manual and your parent handbook, 
that include substantial and appropriate policies and procedures regarding the general description of your program, the mission of your program, the disability groups served, the grade levels served, the capacity to address referral behaviors and concerns, transfer and 30-day IEP meetings, and your admission requirements. Section two is the educational environment, and it's made up of five parts. This approval element can be found in Title 20A, Section 7204, and user Section 12, Paragraph 2. For Part A, we're going to ask you to describe how your SPPS provides a school environment to students that is safe, healthy, and appropriate. Part B, we're going, we ask for board uh, approved dated policies and procedures to specifically reference student access to health and medical services as specified in the SPPS initial application part 12. So we're looking for a healthcare plan <clears throat> that includes provisions made for medical, nursing and infirmary care of students training by a physician or registered nurse to all staff that administer medication to students. This is still part B. Uh, we'd like to have a policy for emergency first aid and care that includes training of all direct service staff in emergency first aid, secure storage of adequate first aid supplies, Posting of telephone numbers for the fire department, police station, poison prevention center, hospital emergency room, and ambulance service providing coverage to the school. We'd like your procedures to be followed in case of illness or emergency, such as a motor vehicle accident, including methods of transportation and notification of parents. Also your procedures that are to be followed in case of fire or other type of emergency. Your procedures for informing parents of any medical care administered to their child or any injury or illness that requires care other than basic first aid. Your procedures to be followed in the case of illness or emergency if the parents cannot be reached. And that was the end of part B. Part C is your educational environment. This is a chance for you to show off what you do at your school for your students and with your students that meet these criteria. We would like your innovative activities and programming because we know that you all do it. So this is your brag time. For part D, we would like your policies and procedures about academic interventions and positive behavioral interventions and supports. And part E, we'd like safety protocols as necessary places that there are increased risk of injury, such as an automotive um, program or a construction program or rock climbing or woodworking um, and those types of things. This wraps up section two. Moving on to section three. The qualification of staff, this approval element can be found in Title 20A, Section 7204, and in user, Section 12, Paragraph 2. We would like documentation for all, um, documentation for all staff for this element should include um, their instruction assignments of education technicians and special ed teachers employed and a schedule of appropriate supervision of ed techs as outlined in MUSER and in chapter 115. We also need staff's position held and only for those hired after annual school approval, their applicable license number. We have created um, an Excel spreadsheet for that and the headings will tell you what to put on it. Reporting staff qualifications is also a requirement for general annual school approval. So we'll be able to access that information that anyone was employed by your school and reported on your annual general approval application submission to Pamela Ford Taylor. Uh, 
So for the certification license number, we're asking only for the staff that have been hired after you submitted your documentation to DOE for your annual school approval. This should be reported. Sarah, Sarah, yes. I'd like to interject for just a moment though. Okay. Uh, to ask actually for the license numbers for anybody who's a related service provider, regardless of when, if those names were provided for school approval, because the, the Department of Education doesn't credential licensed providers. We only credential education staff, ed techs, teachers, administrators. And so um, from the certification office perspective, those individuals that are related service providers only get fingerprint checks, just like a volunteer in a school. And we have to actually check the license number against the two websites that we have, a state website and a national website for BCBA, for example, um, to look at the active status of particular licenses. So mm -hmm. that, that, that letter D, we only need you to provide us information about your education staff that's new since your July 1st submission to Pam Ford Taylor. We don't want you to duplicate work, right? But for related service providers, we need all of their information because we have to go to a different source to check their license. Okay, that does make sense. Yes, thank you. <laughs> sure thing. So um, if so we we have added this certification form. Um, if you would like to use it, it's just a template. You may design your own way of reporting this information. Um, and so because we have had some feedback about streamlining, this form will collect data for sections three and six and seven. So you'll use this form for three different sections of your desk audit. Um, all elements of section three that I just reviewed, except for part B, which is the schedule of appropriate supervision, are captured on this form. You may send this form once in section seven because it uh, covers all of section seven and just make a note in sections three and six to see section seven. Moving on to section four, this approval element can be found in title 20A section 7204 and user section 12 paragraph two. The muser language for professional supervision includes at least one full-time staff member shall be designated as the educational administrator for the program such person shall be assigned to supervise the provision of special education services in the school and ensure that the services specified in each child's IEP are delivered. Each SPPS must employ an on-site supervisory person who has either a special ed administrator O30 or an assistant director of special ed O35 certification or a special ed consultant certification, which is an 079, which has been eliminated, but if an employee previously held the certification and it didn't or doesn't lapse, then the certification was or will be grandfathered. If you do not have um, a special ed administrator on site, you may have a special educator with a 282 or a teacher of children with severe impairment 286 certification who holds a master's degree in special ed and a one year of administrative experience. If you do use an 079, a 282, or a 286 as your on site supervisor, Muser states that the individual holding that certificate must have at least five hours per month of supervision by a special ed administrator O30 or an assistant director of special ed O35. So please include supervision logs for all of 2023, January through November in this tab, if you're using the latter model of supervision at your SPPS. Section five, your plan of instruction. 
This approval element can also be found in Title 28, Section 7204, and in User, Section 12, Paragraph 2. This approval element asks for the curriculum materials that you are using in your school. Is it a curriculum adopted from one of your referring SAUs, or do you use your own? Please submit documentation of the curriculum that you use, including general curricula for all nine content areas and intervention curricula to close ELA and math achievement gaps and demonstrate that it is in alignment with the main learning results and Common Core State Standards. We also ask for a description of the assessments you are using in your school. Muser Section 2, Paragraph 4 defines assessments as follows. For children 3 to 22, assessments under Part B means the ongoing procedures used by appropriately qualified personnel to measure the educational and functional achievement of students as related to their IFSP or IEP goals and on state and district-wide tests, which are aligned with Maine's learning results. In this section, we want to see how your school is measuring educational and functional achievement and what assessments are being used with the curriculum to measure progress and to demonstrate student proficiency. You should also describe in this section how your school is providing access to the general ed curriculum and to extracurricular activities for your students. What processes do you have in place for this to occur? Please do not send your entire curriculum. You may send outlines, curricula maps, links to the online curricula. Those are appropriate submissions. Importantly, we will use your standards-based report to help satisfy parts of this element. So in addition, please do not duplicate what was provided for your 2023 SPPS transition to standards-based reporting. You will also need to submit a 2324 school calendar that demonstrates a minimum of 175 student instructional days, as well as sample classroom schedules that provide an average of 25 hours per week of instructional time for every two week period. The DOE rule in chapter 127, uh, section 218, defines instructional time as that portion of a school day devoted to the teaching and learning process, but not including extracurricular activities, lunchtime, or recess. Time spent on organized field trips related to school studies may be considered instructional time, but the instructional time counted for extended field trips shall not exceed a normal school day for each day of the field trip. So most SDIs, during, I'm mean, sorry, most SPPSs during recess and lunch are doing specially designed instruction on functional skills. So if, so please don't send us a, a school schedule that just says lunch because that doesn't count according to the DOE rule. But if you say small group lunch um, or um, social skills at lunch or something like that, that just shows that you are doing SDI during lunchtime. Um, and if recess is just teachers standing, you know, and, and kind of watching kids um, like regular in a, in a public school uh, recess, then that does not count towards your 25 hours per week of instructional time. Um, but if recess is specially designed instruction and uh, teacher-led games or something like that, then also please be clear in your, in your uh, explanation that specially designed instruction is happening during recess. Yeah, there has to actually be direct interaction between staff and students in order for it to count as SDI. And in the, yeah. in the example that Sarah gave at lunchtime, there's many, many of you guys that work with uh, your students on specific functional, actual daily living skills around the prepping lunch and all of that. That all counts as SDI, but mm -hmm. there has to be actual interaction between staff and students. It can't be a staff standing back and supervising like in a typical setting. That doesn't count right. as SDI. Yep. Thank you, Mary. 
So now we're going to move on to section six, adequacy of support services. This approval element can be found again in Title 20A, Section 7204 and MUSER, Section 12, Paragraph 2. Section A information will be documented on the Provider Certification License Form, submitted also for the Sections 3 and 7 that we discussed. So we would need a list of all related service providers, hours employed or contracted if they're full-time or part-time, and their applicable license number. And these are whether they're hired by the SPPS or whether they're outside contracted or whether they're SAU providers. We need um, information for all of the providers that are, that are giving services at your school. We also need grids for five months, including September through November of 2023 of related service providers for all students enrolled, outlining IEP determined service amounts required, services provided, codes of reasons for services are missed, and make updates. So September, October, November are three months. The other two months of 2023 could be during summer or spring. The sample Related service grids are provided in Word format and as an Excel spreadsheet. The Excel spreadsheet is formatted to calculate the data that you enter. These forms were sent electronically last week. You should fill in the key at the bottom of the form to include any reasons that the student may not receive services. If other is used as a category, it needs to be defined in order to be able to determine whether the missed services need to be made up. If you choose not to use the DOE, one of the DOE forms, please send a copy of your form to um, the sppsgss.doe at main.gov email address by October 27th so that we can review it and provide feedback if necessary before you submit it in the desk audit. We want to ensure the necessary components for monitoring are included in a streamlined format that prevent duplicate duplication of work for your service providers. Your form needs to incorporate what related services are required or documented on each student's IP, as well as services that were delivered, services that were missed, reasons for missed services, and tracking to demonstrate that missed services were made up or planned developed to make up missed services when known in advance for situations such as parental leave of a service provider. We would like to have the data submitted for each related service provider, including all employed and contracted providers, um, as I said, and also, as I said, providers from partner SAUs used to serve the students at your SPPS. Um, oh, and I said this before, too, for five months, including two months from the spring or summer of 2023, if your SP SPPS provides ESY or summer programming, and three months from September to November of 2023. You also need to submit evidence of individualized treatment using valid and reliable measures to obtain baseline data. So that means please identify the tools, what assessments or what other tools do your related service providers use to inform their service plan development and any amendments they might make. So we're halfway through the 12 sections of the desk audit. What questions do you have? So Sarah, I have a quick question. Uh, sure. so just the timing of my site visit is 12-9. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. So knowing that you want desk audit stuff by 12-29, would mm -hmm. it be appropriate for me to give that to you? I know like in a- It would be court, now. Okay. All right. Yeah, that... I know you and I talked about this and you wanted to give it to me in September and right. I didn't want it in September, but right. absolutely. Okay. See, I, I could read your mind, Jody. You I could. Knew you were going to ask. I, I knew you would. Thank you. <laughs> sure thing. Anytime. Sarah, I have two quick questions. Number sure. one, is there, is there a way to find out what is, so the stuff that you reviewed, like policies and that kind of stuff, what mm -hmm. is new since the last time we went through so we don't have to reinvent? So if the policies and stuff passed last time or were good, are there, is there a way to see, like, if any? Your last submission? 
Yeah, no, no, I mean, I have this up, but is there a way that you guys could tell us if there has been a change in requirements from the last three years, or are those things the same as they were three years ago? So, so Eric, we don't have a formal crosswalk, <clears throat> but what I can tell you, because our team has been very um, actively involved in the legislative process for the past two years, so I can't speak to three years ago, but we do know that most recently chapter 33 has has been revised. And so there's additional requirements related to that. And so when we look at your chapter 33 policies, you might recall those of you that have been through this process previously, you might recall that our expectation was that your policy was um, submitted and approved to your board of, or by your board of directors um, sometime after July of 2014, because that was the most recent revision to the chapter 33 at the time. So now our expectation will be that it's been reviewed and um, it might not be approved yet because this is such a new change. Um, but so you could, um, you could actually put a plan in, pr but present your, um, so you're doing desk audits in December. You might, they might actually have had it. So present your agenda, it's been presented and approved or in process um, or whatever that, what, wherever it is in that process because it's such a new change. But our expectation would be after August, I don't remember the specific day in August, but that it actually was effective. But that's what we'll be putting on our paperwork, right? It is what the legislative um, uh, body gave us as an effective date. Sorry, so just for clarity, I thought we were still waiting for DOE's Chapter 33 guidelines to come out. <laughs> so Bear Shea is working on the guidance. Okay. This is how the legislative process works. It has nothing to do with us. I don't understand it myself, Eric. Like, just for example, the last time user changed in 2017, you were... At, as the field, and I was in the field, I was with you actually, Eric, in 2017, before I joined the department. When these those new rules came out, we were expected to implement them as soon as they were effective, even though the guidance came out like six months later, like it's retroactive to the date that the legislative body made it effective, which I can't make sense in my head, but I don't develop that process, right? We just have to follow it. So I hear you loud and clear. I understand your perspective. Um, and what we've been told is that the implementation date is effective August something. And we had it on our last SPPS agenda that we reviewed. Um, and it's really hot off the press and new. So I don't have that date stamped in my head yet. <laughs> no, that's fine. I'm, I, so we're just using the language from the actual legislation to make sure our policy is used. Yes. Right. And I would, I mean, I would suggest because it's really a hard place to be. Like, I remember that, like thinking, wow, that's crazy. They've made changes and they expect us to implement them before they even give us the, I just remember being in the field thinking that, right. And so my suggestion to you guys would be um, um, to develop draft based on what the legislative um, bodies have um, charged and um, and and uh, indicate that it's in draft form because you're waiting for the formal guidance to come from the appropriate sources at the department. That would be my suggestion. <laughs> right, and I guess it depends on how in depth your policies, your board approved policies are, because the um, the legislation itself was passed a while back. And we've been trying to figure out how to do that. And then the rules, thank you, Jennifer, um, August 6th of 2023, the written rules went into effect. And so um, you could use the written rules to help inform your policies. Um, and then the guidance itself is kind of more, I don't know if your policies would reflect around guidance. So I'm right. not sure how, That's yeah, really I'm not sure point. how. How, yeah. I'm not sure how deep your policies go, so. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Really good point, distinction between policy and procedure, Sarah, thank you. Sure thing. Yeah. Um, so there were some questions in the chat and Star's question about um, observing classrooms with a vacancy in that position. Um, we might wanna peek in and see how your substitute is doing. 
So, uh, yeah, and I'm going to say apologize, first of all, because I misinterpreted your question, Star. I didn't realize it was specific to the site visit when you asked. Um, uh, and so, yes, we will want to, right? It's up to, and we have actually observed classrooms that had subs because somebody called out sick or because there was a vacancy or, and, and folks give us that information and we take it into consideration, obviously, but it's part of the reality of, of school, whether you're a private school or, or a public school these days. And actually, honestly, it was part of the reality prior to the pandemic. It's just more exacerbated, right? Um, so we, yeah, we would still expect to be able to observe. And um, the sending SAU related service providers, we would need all of the information that we're asking for any related service provider. We would need um, their certificate and their license. We would need their five months of, um, of uh, service grids um, and all of that. So just anybody who is serving kids in your school, just to make sure that, um, and if they're hired by the SAU, we're gonna make sure that the SAU is sending people as they should be. Okay, thanks. And um, if we had a copy, Jen, like Mary said in the chat, if we had a copy of the actual provider's certificate, that would be wonderful extra information. So super. certainly streamline our process and uh, the time, our response time, because we wouldn't have to go to the licensing agents to look up every single provider for every mm -hmm. single school in the cohort. Yep. Because if yep. we see the expiration date, we know when it's active, right? <laughs> we sure do. Right. Anything else? Well, we take this little midway break. Thanks for the great questions. Absolutely. All right. We are continuing on with section seven, which is the fancy special education and related services provider certificate and license form. Gay made it look very nice. I appreciate that. Um, this approval element can be found again in Title 20A section. Oh, this, this is a new section, 4502. And Muser, uh, section 10, paragraph 2. The information will be documented on this provider certification license form that you submitted also for sections 3 and 6. You'll need to include teacher-student ratio and caseloads. Um, and there is, uh, from user, the staff child ratios for self-contained services and all SPPSs are self-contained services. And we will also need on the form teachers full names and student ratios and their caseloads. So there are columns for all of those on the form. Okay. Section eight is the continuum of special education services. And this approval element can be found in Muser, section 12, paragraph two. And for this, you're gonna explain how the services you provide to your students assist them in moving along the educational continuum towards a lesser restrictive environment. And the range of educational settings included in the continuum is outlined in Muser section 10, paragraph two. Um, however, when they're in the SPPS, they can still move along LRE because when they first come, maybe they have two staff with them, but then they learn some skills and they only need one staff with them. That is a little bit of movement al along the LRE. Some people get um, you know, they think about the percentage at the end of the IEP. So kids in your school that are fully in your school are going to be at 0%, but they could still have movement along, along, along the LRE continuum. So uh, we're looking for a description of the transition supports provided for students in the census at intake during the length of stay at your SPPS, and during transition to other school settings, including supports such as voc rehab, if applicable, put in place at the SAU or 
um, if your child is your student is moving SPPSs to the new SPPS. We also would like a list of specific examples of individualized, less restrictive opportunities throughout your SPPS enrollment. So you're doing a gradual release of supports. You're giving them access to the general curriculum. They're getting access to extracurricular activities at your SPPS, at public school, and in the community, supporting movement on the LRE educational continuum, as outlined in MUSER, for five or more students, including unique information from all sites. So here's a template. We're going to talk about Johnny from SAU 9 million. And number one LRE opportunity is that he came with two staff and now he just needs one. LRE opportunity, and that happened in October. Another LRE opportunity is that we're going out into the community to the library. Um, another LRE opportunity is that the SPPS and the SAU talked together and got him enrolled in an extracurricular activity. Um, so those are sorts of the examples that we would like. Uh, this is section eight continued. We would also like specific discharge data for the past two years to include the student name, their date of birth, their disability, the admission date, their discharge date, the grade level, the name of the receiving school program or graduation. And um, excuse me for just one Thanks, sorry about that. Moving on to section nine. This is only for students who are in grades nine through 12. And this is the graduation and work diploma agreement. Um, copies of the annual graduation work or credit agreements with sending high schools principals were, um, there's a link to them there. This approval element can be found in MUSER section 12, paragraph two. It was also sent out um, with the agenda on April 26, and it was included in the paperwork that Gay sent last week. A new work diploma agreement needs to be signed each year before school starts for all students in grade nine to 12. State law prohibits other staff positions, such as the special ed director, or the superintendent from signing the graduation diploma agreement because high school diplomas can only be conferred by the building principal. State law does not prohibit additional SAU signatures to meet unique situations, such as communities without a high school, if so desired by the high school administrator conferring the diploma. So in addition to the principal um, or the dean of students, a special ed director or a superintendent may also sign. Okay. This is section 10, the notification and reporting of serious events. This approval element can be found in user paragraph, I'm sorry, section 12, paragraph two. And it should be noted that this is a distinctly different policy of notification legally required. So it's different than mandated reporting. This is a user expectation. Um, often we get, and we know that you're licensed and regulated by DHHS and you have, you know, main care stuff that you have to send and all of that, but MUSER has its own specific language. So we need to make sure that um, when reading through, we find the MUSER language. So this submission includes um, your SPPS policy. And so this is a quote from user. And so these are the, this is the information that needs to be in your notification policy. That you have a reporting of serious events, immediate notification and reporting of serious events, including a serious injury or death of a child, criminal activity on the part of a child or staff member, or other serious incidences affecting the well-being of any child. 
the school shall immediately notify by telephone and by letter the parents, the sending school district, any state agency involved, and the main Department of Education. So if any of those things happen, uh, DOE would need a phone call and then a letter emailed later. And Sarah, if I could, just because mm -hmm. I like to provide concrete information, especially mm -hmm. for folks who might be new, I would mm -hmm. liken your description, which was excellent, by the way, um, at the beginning of this section around the notifications to the fact that your SPPS is licensed by multiple agencies and the distinction between FERPA and HIPAA is for confidentiality laws, right? So that's a, another concrete example of as an SPPS, you have mul multiple licensing and approval agents and you have to um, observe all of the laws applicable to each of those agents. And this specific section 10 is um, the notification that DOE requires for approval. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. Um, so here's section 11, your rule governing physical restraint and seclusion. Uh, this approval element can be found in the main Department of Education rules, chapter 33. Chapter 33 notes that each covered entity must provide annual overview and awareness information to staff and provide annual notice informing parents of the chapter 33 rule and your SPPS policy and procedures related to the use of restraint and seclusion, including the local complaint process. Your policy should note when your Board of Educators last reviewed and approved the policy to ensure that the most recent legislative requirements are included in your policy. So for this cohort, it's the new rule that went into effect this year. Um, as we said before, the, the rules went into effect August 6, 2023. So as Mary said before, if you can't get it board approved by December, um, send us a draft. All crisis intervention curricula will be reassessed for compliance with the updated rule. And every SPPS needs to update their policies in accordance with the change. We also would like to uh, have your, um, so that was sections A, B, and C. Section D is documentation of training of the crisis intervention curriculum, including dates and frequencies and a list of participants to make sure that all of your staff are trained in whichever curricula you choose. Okay, we're done section 11. Um, what questions do you have about the first 11 sections on the desk audit? Sorry, I put a question in the chat and I, okay. instead of um, uh, answering it immediately, I wanted to do uh, have a conversation because I want to make sure we understand it correctly, Star. Um, so uh, let me pull it back up. Oh, the ratios. Um, I, I would like to make sure I understand your question. The ratios components that are outlined in Muser, we're, what we're looking for on your form is um, for us to understand what each teacher caseload, the case management piece. So how many students are they responsible for? How many staff are they responsible for? And that's what the ratios in, in the Parentheses in Muser indicate, for example, if a, you're working in an elementary classroom, there's a specific ratio, I don't remember what it is, one to six or something, um, one to five. And, and then there's another number in parentheses. That other number gives you permission as an SPPS in that classroom for that teacher to case manage additional students if there's adult support available in that classroom. Does that answer your question or is there I think another? It does. No, I think it does. So I, I'm looking right now back at that slide and it says ages five to nine, it would be a six to one ratio. And then yep. it gives you permission to, in theory, have a 11 to one ratio with one to ones, correct? With that no, extra if five. If you have adult support, that person can case manage additional students. Yes. And Thank yes. You. Yep, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and thanks for asking that star and that clarification, Mary. We are, yeah, we're looking at Muser, not at IEP. So, I mean, if all of your kids have a one-to-one -one on their IEP. Um, <laughs> yeah, 
yeah, yeah. But we're making sure that Muser is covered and that your base is covered. Right. Okay. Um, and so Jody McGuire asks, hypothetically, and Jody, this has been, um, we've had this situation happen before. So um, what is the district responsibility for SPPS monitoring process when a student is placed at an SPPS via a mediated legal agreement that states the placement is considered a parental placement and shall not be incorporated into the student's IEP with no obligation to hold IEP meetings? When that occurs, <clears throat> we don't get those IEPs to review because it's we can't override court, obviously. So it doesn't happen often, but it happens. And when it happens, they're just not included in the number of, but I would expect communication from the SPPS um, and or SAU um, to, to be transparent about that. Like I remember the very first school um, that I um, that I was involved in monitoring when I joined the department many years ago. It's been over six years now, six and a half years. Um, I, I I had to get clarification because the director was asking a question and said, I only have five students with IEPs. And I said, what do you mean? Help me understand that. Why do only five children have IEPs? <laughs> anyway, um, yeah, we wouldn't include them in our data collection. Right. Um, and Catherine Adams, you put a symbol. Was that a question or was that? It was a typo. Okay. Thanks, Catherine. Okay. Um, Sorry, I, I yep. couldn't find my unmute. Go um, ahead. Quick question. Around the, the two years of discharge data, I mean, there are a few cases where we don't know where the student is going to go after. Should we just, I'm assuming we would just put that they would still be part of their sending district. Like we don't know, like they might be discharged from us, but not have another placement that we know about. So we would just put they return to their district. So, um, that's a good question, Eric. And I, I, I'm thinking some of that may be due to timing of the, you providing the information. It's unknown. I, um, if it's a something that has happened fairly recently, um, you could say unknown um, and identify the SAU. Um, uh, uh, part of our purpose, obviously we're looking at LRE, but part of our purpose too in the big picture is making sure that children are not languishing somewhere, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, without programming access. And so uh, my hope would be um, if it's somebody who's been discharged um, and you don't know at the time of discharge that there's some kind of follow-up um, uh, to, I don't, I don't know. <laughs> okay. I can ask yeah. outside yeah. of this, but yeah. you know, I guess the, the a scenario is that a student was looking at another placement when they were discharged with us, but we don't know if that placement actually went through or yep. not. And, and so that would be extremely helpful information. To, you could put unknown and put, but put that these were being investigated because then our, my team can actually do follow up with the SAU that you have identified to say what happened with this kid. Because ultimately it is the SAU's responsibility to provide FAPE. And for those youth who, are unable to get FAPE in their home school. As you know, they get sent to out of unit placements. And so the school district would be able to be the, the actual entity that provided follow-up. Okay, thanks. So thank you. Great question, Eric. Okay, anything else before we move on to your self audit and Leora? Okay, Leora, I shall share my screen. Awesome, thank you. Okay, so we're in section 12. This is the on-site review monitoring tool, which we call the OSR. It's a comprehensive tool provided in both a Word format and an Excel format. 
The word format is a guidance document, which includes criteria and corrective activities for each item being reviewed. You'll use the Excel version to complete your self audit. The self audit is the final component of the desk audit, and it is the same as the tool used for the site visit file reviews. Um, and in a few slides, we're just going to walk through the OSR um, Excel sheet really um, quickly. Um, we recognize that the sending school is responsible for the IEP and for approval of the IEPs developed and implemented at SPPSs. The IEP writing trainings and B13 trainings for writing transition plans conducted by the DOE Public School Federal Monitoring Team are open to SPPS staff, and the DOE OSI professional learning training recordings can be accessed on our, our website. And those are um, all recorded. You can get contact hours. Um, and they're good training videos. Thank you, Sarah. Oh, next slide, please. Oh, sorry. You got it. I got it. Hold on. Oh, okay. Here we go. A little bit of a technology thing. Okay. So the, um, so we refer to the electronic monitoring tool as the on-site review tool, the OSR. And there are fewer elements than the last time that you went through monitoring. So you will use the self-assessment tool to review 20%, but not less than 10 of your student files, IEPs from the 22-23 school year. If your student population is less than 20, 50% of the student files will be reviewed for this element. Please make efforts to provide a representative sample across disabilities, ages, ethnic groups, case managers, SAUs referring to your program and state agency client or state board status. Because we are scheduling our site visits before the desk audit is due, we will ask you to review the files that we have not already reviewed. If possible, recognizing that the size of your school may affect your ability to do this. Each SPPS will use the FY24 self-audit SPPS OSR implementation of FAPE to review 20% of their student files, a minimum of 10, or for the if the total number of enrolled students is less than 20, 50% of the files should be reviewed in the self-audit. DOE will use the same tool to review an additional 10 student files during the site visit. This may be adjusted for programs with fewer than 10 students, so the files reviewed by DOE and the files reviewed in the self-audit may overlap for SPPSs with low enrollment. Thanks, Leora. Um, I just want to clarify that um, you, oh gosh, I didn't mean to do that, um, that we will be, you will be looking at current files. So, I mean, Leora did say IEPs from the 22-23 school year, but that was, we should have taken that out of her notes. So, so you folks will be looking at current files, just like Leora will be looking at current files. Sorry about that. Thank you, Sarah, for that clarification. Okay. My goodness gracious. Okay. Can you... I'm trying to juggle a couple of things here and it's not going as well as one would hope. <laughs> okay, so can we see the next slide? If you haven't already. Yeah, it. it's there. Perfect, thank you. Okay, so in addition, there should be at least one student file of a 2023 graduate reviewed in your self-assessment to verify the summary of performance requirement outlined in MUSER. If your student, um, if your SPPS had graduating seniors during this past school year, um, the summary of performance form that's a required form under IDEA, it is used to provide information and recommendations designed to assist the student after graduate or aging out. The summary of performance must be completed during the final year of a student's high school education using the most current information available regarding the student's performance. The summary of performance should be written in a way that it's useful to the student. It may be accompanied by documents useful in assisting the student with transition from high school to a higher education, training, or employment setting. 
Statements should be positive and supportive of the child's post-secondary goals. This summary is an opportunity to describe ways in which the student positively impacted the high school environment. The summary should be written with the student's input and with student inclusive practice with a goal of acquiring and using self-advocacy. Review of this document with the student is suggested. Refer to the procedural manual, pages 82 to 86, available on the Maine Department of Education website for more specific information and sample language to use in each section of the form. The DOE Special Services team will use the same on-site review monitoring tool to check 10 files at our on-site visit. We're looking for evidence that the student files in your program contain all the items required for an out-of-district placement. There are 21 items on this tool being reviewed, some of which will apply to all student files, such as the record of access sign-in sheets and out-of-unit 30-day reviews, and others which apply only to specific populations, such as the transition items for high school students and the particular evaluation reports. For example, a speech language or OT evaluation present in the files. Another example is academic needs for a student performing at or near grade level in ELA and math, whereas functional needs and performance would be expected for all students in an out-of-unit placement as their LRE. The file monitoring tool looks at three aspects relating to transition plans. So we want to note that for children in grade nine or beyond, the student's IEP should include a post-secondary transition plan that is updated at least annually, include periodic transition assessments each year. These transition plans should be the primary focus driving the remainder of the IEP for high school students and are part of the student record development of the transition plans are the responsibility of the sending SAU, but we ask that the SPPSs review IEPs to ensure they contain current transition plans when applicable. And in just a few minutes, I'm going to go over the on-site review tool and the calendar of activities, the process of submitting evidence, and the site visit and fiscal monitoring expectations with you. Next si slide, please, Sarah. Thank you. Okay. So this is a SNP from the on-site review monitoring tool from the Word version. This tool lists the items and citations for which the 22-23 special education files will be monitored. This tool includes the corrective activities for each item and citation should provide the SPPS, should the SPPS demonstrate non-compliance. Please do not submit corrective activities at this time. This tool is for your reference only. Thank you, Sarah. Whoop, hold on. There we go. Um, so this is a snip from the Excel version. This is where we're, we're going to walk through this in just a second. This form was provided in advance. I should have been in the email last week. And I encourage you to open the form as I review it so you can practice using the form during this presentation and have an opportunity to ask questions as we go through how to use the form. Thank you, Sarah. So this is an example of an item um, on the OSR. Again, we call it the on-site review monitoring tool. The total level of compliance calculates automatically. So a plus indicates that the yes criteria is met and a minus indicates the no criteria. Some items have the option of NA, which is not applicable. Okay, so the following directions for using the Excel version of the OSR are provided using a PC because that's what the state uses. Um, if you're using a Mac, some of the directions may differ. Okay, so um, we're going to go through the directions and then we're going to look at the, um, the tool itself. So you'll see um, that there are uh, place, there are boxes to fill in the responsible SAU, the date of placement, the child's first name, last name, date of birth, age, and disability. Please use the dates using the two numerals for month, two numerals for day, and then four numerals for year. Um, recording the date of placement is important for the following items on the OSR. For OOU5, which is evidence that an IEP meeting was convened to review the IEP 30 days after placement, 
and IAP4, which speaks to academic annual progress of the child. Please have the date of placements readily available for the on-site review of files. The date of placement is the date the IEP team determined that the student starts in the program. Sometimes this differs from the actual first day of school for the, set for the student due to illness or snow days. Okay, whoops, let me get back up there. All righty. Oh, just one. Here we go. Okay, so each cell has a drop down menu, and the only, oh my gosh, hold on. Here we go. Um, and the only accepted entries are plus minus, or in some cases, NA. Um, if anything else is entered, a message will pop up. Um, and if this box pops up, you can select cancel and enter an appropriate selection. Um, just from personal experience, um, I know that sometimes this gets this tool can get a little bit wonky if you don't press enter after each of your pluses and minuses. Okay, so if you prefer not to use the drop down selection in the cell, this is for manual input of pluses and minuses or NA. If you, this is what I was just talking about, I was ahead of myself. If you don't hit the, if you do not hit the enter key and instead use an arrow key or a mouse to move or click to a different cell, Excel will think you're selecting the data in that cell that you move to for data entry. If you hit enter after moving, you'll get the pop-up box in the last slide. If you hadn't, haven't hit enter, you'll need to hit the escape key to get out of the selection mode. Okay, let's see. Sarah, did you change the slide? I did. We're Thank looking at um, students A and B. Wonderful. That is super duper helpful. Okay, it would be more helpful. There we go. Okay, so you can select one common, uh, one column to check the data on that particular child. Hover the cursor over the letter on the top gray bar that aligns with the child. When you see an arrow, click on the column and it will be highlighted. Next slide, please. You can hide rows and columns, hover the cursor over the first column or row that you want hidden, and move the last column or row that you want hidden. Right click and select hide on the menu, and you can unhide the same way. I like the hiding and unhiding over freezing panes, but it's really a personal opinion. Some people like freezing the panes better, and that is on the next slide. Thank you, Sarah. So you can freeze panes to keep the child name and column visible and allow the subsequent columns with the child's information to scroll. So for this one, you click on column I, the first child's information column, and then click view in the menu bar, click on freeze panes, and then you can unfreeze the panes in the same process. Um, if you have, and when you're going through and you're starting the, this process with the OCR, if you have any questions and you you it's probably likely that you will because this might be a new um a new way to do this for you then please email me or call me as soon as possible and I can talk you through that and it will be um it will be an easier process for you than trying to uh problem solve that yourself so I'm totally available to help you out okay so I am going to close that and I'm going to share screen for a minute so that we can look at, okay, can everybody see, let me just make it bigger because I know that it's a little bit easier. Okay, so this is the actual OSR tool that you got in an email last week. Um, you can see that it's the 2324 SPPS monitoring file review report. Um, and you will see that it mirrors the slides with the SNPs that we just went through. So we have the responsible SAU, the IEP determined date of enrollment, their first name, last name, date of birth, age, and disability. This particular form right now is frozen. So um, that was the freeze pains piece that I was just talking about. And you can see if I scroll down, 
that the next finding will come up, but the child's demographic information stays the same, which is super helpful um, if you want that information to be available for you. So you can also see here, if we look at OO, U2, which is the IEP team's documentation of the program components of a placement that would support the IEP developed at the meeting. And there's the user citation, because we always want you guys to know why we're looking at why we're looking what we're looking at. Um, so you can see here that a yes criteria is that the written notice clearly documents the discussion of the out of unit placement with all the IEP components specifically to the child's needs. If the answer is no, then it means that it doesn't document um, the discussion of the out of unit placement with all the IEP components specifically to their um, to the child's needs. Needs doesn't ensure LRE discussion, et cetera. So when you put in the pluses and minuses, they auto populate. So you can see for student A, this was a minus. So that written notice did not clearly state um, the required components but for student B, it did. So the compliance level for this would be 50%. And if we look a little bit down further, you can see that for forms, so we're looking for all of the IEPs since the placement that they're included in the file, including any amendments um, between annual IEP meetings. So this is a simple one. Yes, they're all in there or no. Um, the IEPs or amendments are missing or incomplete. And again, you just put in a plus or a minus. You can either do it with the drop down menu or you can do it manually. So I put in a plus for student A and it auto populated. And I just did that with the drop down menu. Um, and it goes also details all of the evaluations that we're gonna be looking to have included in the files as well, which would be the psychological evaluations, academic evaluations, speech and language when appropriate, physical therapy when appropriate, FBAs, and then any other evaluations that the IEP team felt were important for that child to help round out um, the child's uh, profile. Sarah, I'm going to ask you, is there, are there any other details that you want me to cover on the OSR while it's open or is that a okay overview? I think you did a fantastic job. Okay. I just want to make sure because this is my first time with you guys. Okay. okay. All right. What questions do you guys have about that? Anything right away coming up for you, or do you want to get into it a little bit on your own and, and contact me? Either way is fine with me. While we're giving folks a moment to think, uh, Star put a question, of uh, an excellent question in the chat that I'd like to answer because there might be other folks who have the same question related to the 30-day reviews. And, and Star, the 30-day reviews, uh, as you know, IEPs determine when the um, programming takes effect. So um, the 30-day reviews are always calculated based on placement. So the IEP will say when this placement is effective. And for example, if Johnny's first day is um, on the IEP is listed as occurring uh, September 26, 2023. And on September 26, 2023, Johnny is ill and can't attend school. It doesn't matter. That's still his start date because that's what the IEP determined. So you don't go by the first day the child attends because sometimes life factors into, um, into things. You have to go by the IEP team decisions. Um, and so as you're all aware, the current um, expectation in MUSER is 30 calendar days. And that is, it exists so that um, you have time to collect baseline data for those youth that are new to your program in a variety of formats, whether it's academic or um, from a clinical perspective. Um, and then you have the 30 day review to make adjustments on the IEP because you've gotten to collect some baseline data and the student might be in a different place than they were when they were referred to you. 
and on your waiting list. Um, this is, this timeline, as you note, Star, is a challenge. And um, one of the suggestions we have taken from the field and, and we'll take suggestions, um, continue to take suggestions while MUSER is under um, revision in that process. But uh, one of my suggestions, having been in your shoes as a director um, at a couple different special purpose private schools before I came to the state was instead of looking at 30 calendar days that we look at, um, at 30 school days, which ultimately ends up being 45 calendar days and allows folks to have a little more time to collect that baseline data to inform the changes that need to occur on a 30 day IEP. Can I just ask a follow-up question? Sure. Um, so I think what had happened previously was that the um, team would plan to meet 30 days from the meeting. And so that would sometimes be, you know, the kiddo hadn't yet started. So it sounds like what you're saying is that in the uh, written notice, it should be documented that the student starts, that Johnny starts on September 5th, even if he doesn't start until the 7th because of illness. But if we had the meeting back in July, and so it's not 30 days from the meeting date, it's 30 days from- It's 30 days from placement because you have to have an opportunity to collect baseline data, Absolutely. right? Yeah. And sometimes as you just gave in the example star, sometimes folks are meeting in advance of the actual placement. Um, uh, and so, you know, and that could be for a variety of reasons. Could be the child is finishing up stabilization in a crisis placement prior to uh, exiting. It could be that somebody's been on the wait list and that's when you anticipate an opening. But that not only the written notice star, good point, but it should also be documented on the service page of the IEP. When is that SDI that's required to be in an out of unit placement going to start? It will have a begin date and an end date. Right? right, and that's what you go by. Thank you. Yeah, of course. And I agree, Eric. <laughs> Any other questions uh, regarding the pieces that Leora presented or do folks wanna think on it and come back um, as questions arise? You're doing your your own um, audits. <laughs> Hearing nothing, it sounds like we're ready to move on. So as we talked about at the beginning of the presentation, and I will say there is a lot of repetition because there's a lot of information today. So we wanna make sure folks are able to, um, to access it. But after the site visit and the desk audit, the department issues letters of findings. One following the site visit debrief, which summarizes the site visit monitoring activities findings, and the other following the evaluation of SPPS desk audit materials and is sent by the end of January of 2024. The letters will highlight accolades, as well as communicate if there are any findings of concern that might affect continued school approval. The letter of findings, including the summary of findings from the site visit file review, will be sent to both the SPPSs and the SAUs. It should be noted that summary of findings are informational for the SAU and no corrective activity will be required from the SAUs unless FAPE is impacted. Um, and I think I talk about this in a few minutes, but um, just to give a concrete example if, of FAPE being impacted, if, for example, on the IEP, um, these uh, related services were neglected to be reduced from the SDI. So it looks like, for example, Johnny is getting 30 hours of SDI plus uh, 30 minutes of OT a week and 60 minutes of speech and language a week and uh, whatever. So uh, 30, uh, 30 minutes of uh, social work a week, then um, that could be an impact to fake because um, it, um, it, you know it's something that could invoke um, compensatory services if it were to go through the due process proceedings um, and those weren't subtracted from the SDI. 
Um, at any rate, the SBPS will have about three months between the desk audit letter of finding and May 10th of 2024 to resolve any identified areas requiring resolution or revision with more time between the site visit letter of finding and May 10th, which will vary depending on when your site visit occurred. Um, this site, uh, the site visit letter finding includes two parts. Part one is a narrative that captures the information from the site visit debrief and summarizes the findings from each of the site visit monitoring activities. Part two includes the grids that are created by, an Excel, by Excel and summarizes the results of the site visit file review OSR findings. And there may be corrective activities requested in both parts. SPPS file uh, corrective activity is for future work rather than fixing past errors. So if training is required to address multiple findings in the file review, please only send, and I know Sarah said this before, so it's a repeat, but we only want one letter of assurance that identifies all the trainings provided for the findings. For example, if your SAU um, had, or your SPPS, I'm sorry, this particular student had an OOU5, an ISR1, and an IEP4, you could, as an SPPS, submit one letter of assurance telling us when the training occurred that reviewed all three of those elements. In addition, for IEP corrections, please send IEPs developed after the findings were issued. We've had folks send in IEPs that were before our file review. Um, so we need them to be afterwards showing the learning uh, that occurred. Um, and they could be, those IEPs could be annual reviews, they could be amendments to the IEP, or they could be drafts if it's not yet approved and issued by the SAU. Again, we're not looking to have the SAU do extra work. So if there's a particular student's annual that's not quite ready, it's not time yet for the annual, and that's when you want to be having um, the, the, that particular IEP fix, then you as an SPPS could draw up a draft and submit that, showing that you've learned something from what the findings were. Um, so in all of that process, as uh, discussed earlier, it is expected that five students' IEPs will show evidence for all the identified areas requiring correction on the on the IEP as a result of the file review, and three of which of those IEPs would demonstrate your required transition-related corrective activity if, you're, if they're included in your FPPS findings and your school serves high school age students, obviously. So a total of five IEPs submitted per FPPS site. We don't want five uh, IEPs for OU5 and five different IEPs for um, <laughs> whatever, all the different things. We want a total of five. We don't want to waste your time or ours. <laughs> um, and note, only the portions of the IEP relevant to the SPPS monitoring will be evaluated on the IEPs that are selected for file review. And when you're sending additional evidence that's required, please only scan the sections of the IEP that are requested for evidence review, not the entire IEP. Um, you may, if you attended our last, our most recent SPPS um, directors meeting, have heard us talk about there is brand spanking new, hot off the press guidance from OSEP, July 23rd, 2023, that replaces what everyone else call, uh, referred to until then as 0902. And it specifically uh, is geared toward um, monitoring schools and compliance. And so um, we want to only look at the pieces of the IEP that we're required to look at because we don't want to look at something else and find something that we're not looking for because <laughs> uh, that would require fixing too. Anyway, isolated deficiencies discovered during the file review that impact the provision of FAPE, as I just said a few minutes ago, will need to be corrected and reported to the federal monitoring team. So that in the example I gave. So we'll make sure the SAUs know and the federal monitoring team knows just for future reference um, because they have a different um, cycle um, and tiered monitoring for SAUs. Um, and so they, we, we, 
um, both teams share information back and forth. And just so you know, SPPS folks, when the federal monitoring team goes into um, SAUs to do their monitoring, they actually ask for a, um, a, a file to review for uh, one file to review from each of their out of unit, their SAU out of unit placements. So the files get looked at from both perspectives because we look at different pieces um, for compliance from the SAU and from the SBPS respectively. Um, and um, once you review your letter of findings, you'll have until May 10th, 2024 to submit corrective evidence. Evidence that, satisf that satisfies an element will result in such element not being on the corrective action plan. <clears throat> corrective evidence is welcomed as early as completed. Um, and correction is, as I said earlier, is an interactive process with support and assistance to resolve identified deficiencies timely, preventing a need to issue a cap. Early submissions are encouraged and reviews will be timely, feedback will be sent and subsequent submissions reviewed with feedback sent. Evidence for any elements identified on the cap may be submitted up to uh, or up until uh, September 15th of 2024. Approval could be impacted up to and including revocation for any schools that have not successfully <clears throat> resolved all of the identified areas needing to be addressed on the cap by September 15th of 2024. Um, we expect to support you in submitting all evidence, have the evidence reviewed, and have all caps closed and letters of continued approval sent by November 15th, 2024. Because as you might remember, as I talked about earlier, once our process is done, we um, provide information to Erin Fraser so she can get that letter of um, congratulations uh, for, su for successfully completing your monitoring activities and your continued approval. Evidence, both initially and subsequent, may be submitted by email, which is our preferred method, as Sarah said earlier, uh, by sending PDF attachments to our SPPS GSS um, inbox. Sometimes, as she said, there are technology difficulties when attempting to email large attachments. Um, please send your evidence in as few emails as technology allows. And that is a wrap up of that process. Um, so any questions regarding your, the letters of findings and the corrective action plan? All right, moving on to fiscal monitoring. The components of fiscal monitoring include audited financial statements for FY23, copies of any management agreements with parent company, written methodology, the allocation of parent company overhead, a schedule of depreciation if there are if there is any a breakdown of interest expense to asset, a list of all personnel from staff pay sheet that includes name, title, and annual salary, and a schedule of main care revenue. Components of the fiscal monitoring, um, oh, I sorry, I just did that. A portion of the cohort will be fiscally monitored and Barbara McGowan will contact them or have Gay do that on her behalf. Fiscal monitoring activities include the desk audit, site visit, letter of findings, an opportunity to respond in writing to the findings, and they're due 30 days from receipt of the letter of findings. And the fiscal monitoring timeline uh, dates will be outlined in the initial uh, notification of fiscal monitoring that you'll receive from Gay Erskine. Fiscal monitoring questions should be directed to Gay and Barbara and their contact information along with the, uh, the rest of our state agency program team. Um, contact information will be provided on the last slide of this PowerPoint. 
and important reminders. That's Leora. Okay. All right. Um, please, as Mary just said, you know, with the update to the 0902 memo, please only send the pertinent section of the IEP. Please label each submission with the OSR code so we know which finding they're being submitted for. One IEP can be sent and labeled with more than one code. And one letter of assurance or one draft letter to SAUs can be applied to more than one element. And if you need further clarification about these um, important reminders, please um, just reach out to one of us and we will help you out. Just as Leora said, um, please feel free to reach out to any of us with any questions or clarification. Um, here is Mary's email and phone number, Leora's also, Gay Erskine, mine, and Barbara McGowan's. And now we're on to the final slide. Yeah, so I want to thank you, everyone, for joining us today. We look forward to working with you and your teams throughout the monitoring process. Um, are there any questions before we wrap up today's webinar? And um, before I before we finalize everything, I just want to note that I see lots of new names and we have plenty of time. So after the Q&A is completely done, I would love to have folks introduce themselves so that we have a um, an idea of where, where um, uh, who you are and what agency you represent. So any questions today and that we haven't covered along the way? during our breaks. Uh, Mary, I had a question. This is John from Ocasisco. Hi, John. Sure. Hi. I, I just want to be clear on the IEPs of, of the mediated students and whether they need to be included as part of the IEP files or are the mediated agreements more of a quasi private place so that is a great question john and really the answer to that um, is it depends on what the mediated agreement dictates as i understand it there are some mediated agreements that clearly indicate no iep paperwork no paper trail okay equals i don't get to see it other mediated IEP agreements just make the placement and require the SAU to pay for it. In that case, okay. they should still be in um, NEO. They should still be following the same um, expectations that all children follow. It's really the mediated agreement just dictates that the SAU is responsible for the placement and the payment. And we do get to look at those files. So it really depends on the language in the mediated agreement because the only per people that can over um, bypass our oversight capacity is a judge, right? So because we're following state okay. and, and federal law, the only person that can bypass state and federal law is a judge. And so if it says in the mediated agreement, no IEP, no paperwork, that equals Mary's team doesn't get to see it. If the mediated agreement simply, okay. simply makes the placement and dictates who's paying and who's responsible for what, our team does get to see it. It's part of our, it's part of the process. So thank you for that. That's a great question, John, that will help anybody else that might have that same question. Okay. Thanks a lot, Mary. Sure. Any other questions? If not, I'd love to have folks um, introduce themselves. And I think what I'll do, because I have see folks on a screen in no particular order, I think the way you log on, but um, I, I'll just go through the screen and see if I can uh, tag people. And, um, and I see Lise Pelletier. Hi, uh, it is Lise Pelletier. Good job on that. <laughs> Um, this is my second year as director for the Madawaska School Department. Excellent. Thank you so much for joining us today. 
And then next I see Mary Ellen Seymour. Good morning, I am Mary Ellen Seymour and I'm the Pupil Services Director for AOS 47 and that includes Orrington, Dedham and the Airline Community Schools. Thank you so much for your time, uh, ladies. I know how busy and <laughs> gearing up for school. And next I see Jody Raymond who is here while he's on vacation. <laughs> Yeah, uh, Jody Raymond, director <laughs> at Stillwater Academy. In Thank you, Bangor. too. Yeah. And Amanda Sharon, I know you, but other folks may not because there's new folks on the screen. So, hi, I'm Amanda Sharon. I am the special ed director at Pathways Mary Meeting Center in Brunswick. Thanks. And next, I see Eric. Uh, Eric Campo, director of educational services for Spurwing. Thank you. And Star. Good morning, Star Sol McDonald. I'm the head of schools for Connections for Kids Special Purpose Private Schools. Thank you. And then I see next on my screen, Limestone Community. Yes, I share a Zoom, uh, Zoom account with our special ed and it's special ed and business manager that we share the zoom account so it's not specific my name is libby derpo i am the limestone community school coordinator here for special education services thank you so much uh, for joining us today and next i see paula and i also see that she is not at her desk at the moment so paula perkins is the director at opportunity training center up in aroostook county and next on my screen is John, and he already introduced himself. Thank you for joining us from Acasisco, John. Uh, next, I see Brian. Good morning, I'm Brian Hegg. I am the Assistant Director with Connections for Kids. Thanks for having me. Ah, thanks for joining us, Brian. And next, I see Andrea. I'm Andrea Richards. I'm the Director of Early Childhood Services at UCP. Um, we have a K-4 program, the Bridges program um, in Bangor. Thank you for joining us, Andrea. I thought your school was on vacation this week too, so I wasn't sure I'd see you. <laughs> Thank you for coming. It's and I see that Paula is sitting back at her desk. So just because I like to put a name to a face, I, I did tell folks who you are, Paula, but if you wanna say hi for people that might not know you. <laughs> Yes, I'm Paula Perkins. I'm the director of OTC, the Opportunity Training Center in Presque Isle. And, and Diane is here. She's been listening with me. <laughs> She's hiding in the corner. Hi, excellent. Thank you both for joining us. And FYI, for those of you that might not know this in our um, community of practice, Paula is one of the lead facilitators for the standards-based um, instruction assessment and reporting group that supports all of you. Um, and we thank her and Audra Cole from the Margaret Murphy Center for their leadership in that, uh, leading that community of practice. Uh, right, next on my screen, I see McKenna Canham. Hi, I'm McKenna Canham. I'm the assistant director at UCP School with Andrea Richards. Thank you for joining us, McKenna. And Michelle is next. Hi, I'm Michelle Gangelfinger. I'm the assistant director um, for Bangor. And I also have... Um, Hi, I'm Christy Babin, the director of pupil services for Bangor. Hi, thank you ladies for joining us today. Thank you. And next on the screen, I see Jennifer Michoud. Hi, I'm Jennifer Michoud, um, RSU 39 Caribou. Um, I kind of wear a few different hats. I'm the school psychometrist, evaluation coordinator, assistant SPED director. <laughs> so, Thank you for joining us today, Jennifer. And I see Jody McGuire next. And Catherine Coy. Hi, this is turning on my video. I'm Catherine Coy. I'm the director of special education um, at MSAD. I'm sorry, MSAD 45 in Washburn. Thanks for joining us today, Catherine. And I see Will Putnam. RSU 21. 
All right, folks. Well, thank you all for joining us today. Uh, we appreciate it. And as we noted before, this has been recorded and um, you'll have access to it as you, um, as you desire. Uh, for review or should you get new staff that might it might be helpful. Thanks again. And we're going to give you back an hour of your day. <laughs> Enjoy. Bye.